amazing. You know, it took me from a career working on bio-based chemicals to now pivoting over and working on bio-based fuels. It can take you many places. I want to acknowledge the CEO of Genomatica, Christoph Schilling, who's sitting over there. We've spent the last 17 years in friendship, first couple of those across the table, and a long, long period sitting on the same side of the table, tackling questions of how and why that were just constantly being thrown our way. It's quite a, bur it's quite a burden, it's quite a slog to uh, overcome. I was thinking of a really relevant and funny story to share, but Paul is recording this and you and I now have children. <laughs> we're better, better off not. So I wanted to share a story with you all here today about the combination of performance and sustainability and why that matters. Why tackling segments where the demands upon a product to do what it's supposed to do is unforgiving, where close enough is not good enough. Why do we try and tackle these sectors and what do they mean for the conversations around sustainability? As I get kicked off, Jivo is a publicly traded company under the stock ticker of GEVO, in case you have struggles remembering that. We have a great IR site website with a wealth of background information. But to start this story, really I wanted to grab the ending and paint a picture of what we're working towards. And that is this idea of business system integration, an ecosystem of carbon abatement. In the chemical industry, we're fond of this term called Verbund. Some people may know it. We spent years and years talking about it. And if you don't, Verbund is that integration of plant, energy, and infrastructure with the one goal of saving money. But if you think about applying that into the world of sustainability, it can also be used to save carbon. And if you accept that our mission here, the why, is we are here to save carbon, we are selling carbon abatement, then that lends you to this idea that you must think of this entire system and how you can use it to reduce carbon in every part of the system that you touch. Not just the step, not just your process, but in everything else that you do. And in doing so, you have the ability to fully decarbonize, to use all that's available to you to drive that carbon intensity down towards zero to make the impact that we should be making, but also maximizing the value of what you are creating. To put that into practice, Jivo's expanding footprint. We have a renewable natural gas plant in, uh, in Iowa. That facility is taking up manure and making biogas. That biogas is combined with wind energy, and that's providing the power for our fermentation plants. Our fermentation plants, of which we have our demo facility in Minnesota, and we're designing and building out our project in South Dakota for net zero sustainable aviation fuel. These facilities are able to use renewable energy or drive down the uh, carbon intensity of the products that they make. The products they make are burned by our customers, put into the atmosphere. That same atmosphere is used to fuel the, uh, the crops, the raw materials for our processes, using climate smart agricultural practices, further driving down carbon intensity and providing the sort of closed loop into our system. But it's also the integration of electri electrification of our plants, sourcing power that's renewable, helping to drive down that overall footprint. In my story today, I'm gonna to focus on two building blocks, ethanol and isobutanol. But I wanna take them to the extreme sports arena of how those molecules are used. They're really building blocks that can unlock the vast potential of, uh, of product opportunities once you can make them efficiently and you can decarbonize them. But I wanna take ethanol into a story of aviation and I'll take our other product building block into the story of motorsports. So Jivo's net zero plant design is a fully decarbonized ethanol, ethanol uh, carbon negative facility, bolted on with a module for conversion to hydrocarbons for the production of SAF. That combination reduces the carbon intensity by about two thirds. But when you add carbon capture and sequestration, when you add climate ag, and carbon abatement, you're able to take your carbon intensity score down to zero and beyond. A smart design where the performance is also in the economics. So it's important to understand this from a value stack. If you look at what we're producing, sustainable aviation fuel has the requirement to be 50% reduced in CI, but it's jet fuel. And jet fuel sells for about $4 a gallon. Just using an example for you all to consider. By the time you add on 
your tax credits, 45Z, your RINs, your low carbon trading incentives. Uh, you can monetize the scope one emission credit savings to corporate customers of your airlines. You can add almost $5 on top of that stack. So what it says is unless you have a technology and a design that can deliver a aviation fuel less than $8 a gallon, you're not generating an opportunity for investors to have a return. And then you need to be thinking about what technologies can you drive to take that cost down further. Because no mistake, it is the combination of cost through smart design, is the combination of value through carbon abatement that is the equation for how you generate return in this kind of sector. But let's not forget there's also performance benefits in the fuel itself. Aviation fuel burns cleaner, has higher energy density. Now these might not be frequently discussed in these days, but that's because these have already been demonstrated and well understood. We've flown around the world on sustainable aviation fuel. We've answered the question without a doubt that this is a material that performs. Now the challenge is, well, you've got to get the economics correct. So the demand is there. The impact is real. We have over 350 million gallons of contracted SAF demand, which is more than five times the capacity of our present greenfield designs. So what does that mean for us now? Well, we've kind of got to get on with it, yeah? The right technology, with the right design, with the right economic structure, with the right customers, what's left to do? Well, quite a bit, actually. We're going to put the project finance together, and we're going to go and build the damn thing, right? Because then we will have the permission to truly substantiate and demonstrate all of what I've shared. But it isn't just about us and our customers and our shareholders. It's also about the community in which we deploy, rural America and rural regions elsewhere around the world. For every alcohol to jet plant that gets deployed, we generate about 30 million in federal tax revenue, 170 million of local benefits. We produce thousands of construction jobs and over 100 direct operational employees in that community. But if you remember my points about decarbonization, we're also driving the upgrade of energy infrastructure in these rural areas. I think these are great positives to hang on to. The next example to dive into is one of fueling motorsports. Yeah, the extreme sport of racing from the airs, we're gonna buckle up, we're gonna hit the racetrack. We announced about a month ago a deal with Shell, uh, their motorsports division, uh, a purchase agreement for hydrocarbon-based performance blend stock made from our technology. With a two-third reduction in carbon intensity, this is a fuel that has higher energy density, higher octane performance, and cleaner burning. It's a fuel that's stable for the grueling racing season that they have to go through. It meets the demands that these teams are going to put upon it. And I think the really thrilling opportunity here is this is an example where performance really does matter, right? It's the difference between being at the podium or having your dreams crushed. Right? This is a global, passionate audience where they're used to seeing the best of what motor technology can provide. It's the proving ground for what comes next. And if we can prove in front of that kind of audience that you can get the wins whilst reducing your carbon intensity, then you're actually building a passionate sport that can sustain itself for many, many years to come. And I think that's the goal here. There's no federal tax credits. There's no trading scheme that we can plug into like we have with aviation fuels. But there is the recognition by the motorsport agencies that we work with that they have to do this. And they are self-governing, creating the mandates for the teams that participate in their sports. They have to do this. They are auditing. They are proving that people aren't cheating the system, that they aren't lying, that they are, in fact, delivering upon these, uh, these promises. I'd like to acknowledge two of my colleagues that are here today, Austin Valancourt and Danielle Martin, for their work in initiating this deal with Shell and closing the deal with Shell. There's a team of GIVO people right now, led by uh, Brian O'Neill, who are actually operating our facilities, making the product for us to deliver. And whilst on the business side, it's kind of easy for us to dream about smooth sailing, steadily rising profits. But I got to tell you, it's turbulent waters for those poor engineers that are out there deploying technologies first of a kind. They kind of make the smooth sailing look easy for us. And I want to take a moment just to acknowledge their efforts, because we kind of stand upon that foundation that they built for us. That's really about it for my story on the two performance opportunities. 
the importance of demonstrating sustainability there. I want to apologize to the panel that's coming up next because sort of fortuitously I had this concept of talking about, well, what's next? And I want to go beyond the gas tank. And then I realized that's actually the title of the panel that's coming up. <laughs> or, or maybe I knew that and somehow my subconscious latched onto it. But either way, I want to acknowledge that. And this conversation will be carried by them and I think wonderful in great detail. But the point here is, once you demonstrate something, once you're in the game, once you're making product, once you're shipping it, once you're delighting your customers, maybe solving some mistakes, fixing some problems, it gives you permission to do more. And we always want to do more. More returns for our investors upon the hard work that we've put in. So when we think about that, we're now using this platform, these products that we're putting in the marketplace to expand into other conversations. Like what's next? Lubricants, what's next? Other different types of performance blends, what's next? Chemical opportunities that can come out of these hydrocarbon value chains that we're building up. And that's where things start to get really exciting. I mean, not that they weren't exciting before. Heck, this has been a hell of a ride so far. But I mean, I think this is why we keep growing. This is why more people turn up to these conferences. This is why new people turn up to these conferences. And I encourage you all, keep those discussions going. Keep the interactions going because there's a lot more to come yet. Thank you.